I know what you're thinking, and I respect it. What you are thinking is this damn poet is about the only thing between me and the wine bar. <laughs> but I ask you uh, for a few moments to put aside your dreams of future happiness <laughs> and dwell with me uh, in the here and now in this cool, dark room on a blazingly bright summer day here in Sonoma County. Now, anyone watching uh, this event on the internet will hear words, will see images, but they will not experience the human reality of being here together in this place at this time. The world looks different depending on where you see it from, depending on whom you see it with. It sounds different, it smells different, it tastes different. Now, let me show you two images by our exuberant uh, Sonoma County painter, Jack Stuppen. I know a lot of you probably know uh, Jack's work. Uh, someone seeing these paintings back east, uh, you know, will, I think, almost certainly respond to their energy, their color. I know that because when I had them in my offices uh, in Washington, D.C., when I was chairman of the NEA, Several people asked me if they could buy them. Uh, uh, but here today, we see these uh, paintings differently because they depict the places where we actually live. They evoke not just imagination, but memory, physical and emotional memory. Now, the dry hills of Jack Stuppen's summer landscape have a particularly austere beauty to us Westerners, us Californios, uh, who have, been, have lived in a landscape that's a dry landscape. Uh, years ago, I wrote a poem uh, about the dry summer hills, actually even drier you know, than the time of year that I think that Jack is depicting here. And when I finished it, I said, this is a a poem that I think that only Californians could even understand. Uh, ironically, it was published a few weeks later in The New Yorker, uh, and it was translated into more languages than any other poem I've ever written, which taught me something as an artist, that it's often when you're being most local, uh, most specifically local, that you become most universal. The poem depicts the hills of the state in the summer, first the way someone from the East Coast would see them, and uh, then later the way somebody who's native will see them. California hills in August. I can imagine someone who found these hills unbearable, who climbed the hillside in the heat, cursing the dust, crackling the brittle weeds underfoot, wishing a few more trees for shade. An Easterner especially, who would scorn the meagerness of summer, the dry, twisted shapes of black elm, scrub oak, and chaparral, a landscape August had already drained of green. One who would hurry over the clinging thistles, foxtail, golden poppy, knowing everything was just a weed, unable to conceive that these trees and sparse brown bushes were alive, and hate the bright stillness of the noon, without wind, without motion, the only other living thing, a hawk, hungry for prey, suspended in the blinding sunlit blue. And yet, how gentle it seems to someone raised in a landscape short of rain, the skyline of a hill broken by no more trees than one can count, the grass, the empty sky, the wish for water. We don't exist in some abstract and generalized world. We exist every moment of our lives in real places, 
in specific locations with their own climate and terrain, their own histories and cultures. And even as the hyper-commercial, global consumer uh, in economy eradicates most of the local differences of food, clothing, music, architecture, and entertainment, it can't change the existential reality. We exist only in real places, whether we notice them or not, whether we respect them or not, whether we can describe them or not. Now, as a poet, I've realized that one of the most important things I do is give people words, images, metaphors, and stories to describe the world of their daily experience. But I would wager that most people in the United States can't name the trees that are on the street outside of their house, nor can they name the birds that are singing in the branches. They lack both the knowledge of the everyday world around them and the vocabulary to describe it. Now, here in this room, we are sitting on the western edge of North America. We are speaking English, a northern tongue that evolved in cold climates uh, out of Anglo-Saxon, French Norman, and Old Norse, with a little sprinkling later on of Latin, Greek, and Italian. This language was not created to describe the world of our daily existence. When the first English speakers came to California, they found that the inhabitants had pretty much already named everything uh, in Spanish or in the hundreds of indigenous languages that were spoken. Uh, the white Protestants found not Coventries, but Santa Rosas, you know, not New Havens, but Sacramentos, mostly Mediterranean, Spanish, Catholic names, and that made California English different from other branches of English spoken in London or uh, Brisbane from the start. We live in cities named after saints and angels. Santa Ana, Santa Rosa, San Gabriel, Los Angeles, or describing local landmarks, Palo Alto, Costa Mesa, Sierra Nevada. Some towns are even jokes in Spanish, El Segundo. Uh, <laughs> the original English language arrivals also found frequently things which simply didn't exist in England or New England, for which there were no English names. And so they had to use the Spanish and Indian names for ranchos, arroyos, mesas, adobe, pumas, coyotes, abalone, sequoia, and eventually even tacos and tequila. <laughs> uh, these words uh, you know, sort of gave character to Southwestern English. The way we speak in California shows that our local ancestors paid attention to the particulars of the world immediately before their eyes. They sought not just accuracy, but authenticity in their daily experience and articulation of their own existence. They had a real relation to the real places around them. Now, through all of history until quite recently, nearly everyone had to pay attention to the places that they lived in just to survive. What did the local uh, land and weather provide? What crops would grow? What animals would thrive or die? How do you construct homes and churches and buildings out of mostly local material in a way that's appropriate to the local climate? Uh, these local conditions, this deep, natural sense of place, matched by the inexhaustible energy of the human imagination, created culture. Artistic culture, culinary culture, agriculture, horticulture, the clothes, the architecture, the music, the literature that came out of places. Why else do people visit foreign cities 
except to experience the glories of this diversity. Rome does not look like Bangkok. Venice does not resemble Santa Fe. Beijing's forbidden city has a character utterly different than the Alhambra. You don't eat the same food in Honolulu and Palermo, or at least you didn't until recently. <laughs> Here in Sonoma County, in the heart of California's wine country, we see and taste the rewards of this special attention to local soil, to local weather, and local produce. Great vintners learn so well the land that they live on, they know the terroir, to use the French term, that they can create wines of stunning variety and quality. And wine, our local export, is the perfect symbol of culture, of a sense of place. It grows in a specific place, stewarded by artisans who work with nature to perfect it. It is local, but worthy of export. Uh, it is grown here, but it is prized elsewhere. And this is the same th that is true of great art, architecture, food, music, and literature. But we live in a world where local culture, local agriculture, local architecture, and a sense of place is vanishing at an alarming rate. What we eat, uh, what we wear, uh, you know, what we do has been standardized and globalized. Now, globalization brings huge advantages of efficiency and affordability, but it also exacts a price on the land, on communities, and ultimately, I think, the human spirit. And in every one of those transactions with globalization, with standardization, we need to understand what is the bargain that we are making. Over the past half century, most American cities have begun to resemble one another, especially new cities. We live in a world now where the office buildings, the churches, the museums going up in Los Angeles, in Frankfurt, in Shanghai, and in Cape Town are indistinguishable. This represents, I think, a huge impoverishment of the human spirit, a loss of the connection between ourselves and where we live. So I really only have one message for you today. Be present in your own life, in your own place. Be alert to the actual world around you. Know where you are, be able to describe it, and savor it. And if you can't savor it, if you don't even like it, change it. Don't tune it out. Don't turn to a screen to a pseudo world. We need to help create the world in which we want to live, the society in which we want to live, the culture in which we want to live. Now, I showed you uh, two paintings by Jack Steppen. Oops, that's Dina Joy. We don't want him. Let's, there we go. Uh, the first was the, you know, the golden summer hills of California. The other is a blossoming uh, apple orchard in Sebastopol. Uh, I wrote a poem about an apple orchard in Sebastopol. For all I know, it's the same one that Jack is painting. And it goes like this. The Apple Orchard. You won't remember it. The Apple Orchard. We wandered through one April afternoon, climbing the hill behind the empty farm. A city boy, I'd never seen a grove burst in full flower or breathed the bitter sweet perfume of blossoms mingled with the dust. A quarter mile of trees arching above us we walked the aisle alone in spring's ephemeral cathedral. We had the luck, if you can call it that, of having been in love, but never lovers. The bright flame burning, fed by pure desire, nothing consumed, such secrets brought to light. 
There was a moment when I stood behind you, reached out to turn you toward me, but I stopped. What more could I have wanted from that day? Everything, of course. Perhaps that was the point, to learn that what we will not grasp is lost. And maybe that's the point of this whole conference, to learn that what we will not grasp, what we will not protect in the world around us will be lost. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.